heavy suspicion. Dr. Ashok Kumar. Hello, I'm Dr. Ashok Nishar. This lecture is about temperature monitoring. As you all know, temperature is a vital sign that is tightly regulated for normal physiological functions. It is not homogeneous. The deep thoracic, abdominal and sinus temperature is called the core temperature and normal body temperature is around 36.5 to 37.3 and core temperature is best indicator of the thermal status. The rest is the peripheral or skin temperature that is around 2 to 4 degrees cooler than the core temperature and it varies markedly as a function of environmental exposure. Now coming to the thermoregulation, as we have seen the normal range is around 36 to 38 degrees centigrade, but we can see the hyperthermia and hypothermia during our operative procedures. A hyperthermia from 38 to 48 degrees, 30, 40 degrees is commonly seen during fever and exercise, but it can go up to 40 to 44 degrees centigrade and may result into heat stroke with multiple organ failure and brain lesions. Hypothermia, which is very common during surgery, is mild between 32 to 35 degrees, 28 to 32 is called as moderate hypothermia and between 24 to 28 is deep hypothermia and can result into cardiac defibrillation, cardiac fibrillation. Hence, thermal regulation is very much needed for various enzymatic functions as well as for the normal chemical reactions that are controlled with temperature. So why we need this temperature monitoring? As I already said, hypothermia is quite common under anesthesia. Most of the time it is hypothermia, that is 90% of the time, and only rarely we see hyperthermia under anesthesia. This core temperature monitoring facilitates early detection as well as quantification of the hypothermia as well as hyperthermia. Hyperthermia, especially the malignant hyperthermia. Hypothermia, even of milder degrees, from 1.5 to 2 degrees centigrade, has adverse outcomes. It can result into morbid cardiac outcomes with dysrhythmias, increased peripheral vascular resistance, myocardial infarction, and angina. There are more chances of surgical wound infection, poor wound healing, and left to right shift of the oxygen dissociation curve with decreased drug metabolism. There is reversible coagulopathy because of the platelet dysfunction and increased surgical blood loss because of increased protein catabolism results from the stress response. There can be altered mentation, impaired renal functions, prolonged post anesthesia recovery that all results into the increased duration of hospitalization. Coming to briefly malignant hyperthermia, it's a life threatening clinical syndrome that is characterized by the hypermetabolism involving the skeletal muscles. It is seen in susceptible individuals and can be triggered by anesthetic agents, mainly volatile agents and NDMR that is suctionized choline. Hence, it is very important to be vigilant during this perioperative period for the hyperthermia that requires the core temperature monitoring. In these conditions, the core temperature may increase one to two degrees centigrade every five minutes and severe hypothermia are seen in which core temperature goes beyond 44 degrees. Hence, it is a life-threatening situation. It is characterized by hypermetabolism. There is heat production with metabolic respiratory acidosis, activation of sympathetic nervous system along with hyperkalemia, lately DIC, myoglobin urea, and multi-organ dysfunction or failure. To treat this, the active warming should be removed and dentrolin at a dose of 2.5 mg per kg every 5 minutes up to maximum 10 mg per kg is used initially and it can be followed by the maintenance dose for next 1 to 2 days. As per the outcomes resource, research consortium guidelines, we must monitor temperature in all patients undergoing general anesthesia for more than 30 minutes of duration. Temperature should ideally be monitored continuously. However, at 15 minute intervals, interval, it is sufficient to see the temperature. Poor temperature should be monitored even during neuroaxial anesthesia as hypothermia is as likely and as severe 
as seen in the general anesthesia patients. The intraoperative core temperature should usually be maintained around 36 degrees centigrade unless hypothermia is specifically indicated. As per the NICE guidelines, that is National Institute for Clinical Excellence, one should manage inadvertent perioperative hypothermia in adults. And this management involves three phases of perioperative period. First is preoperative period that begins one hour before induction of anesthesia. Then is the entire intraoperative period. And subsequently, last one is the postoperative period that goes 24 hours into the post anesthesia gear unit. As per the uh, recommendations of the NICE, one must assess the patients who are at risk for developing perioperative hypothermia before transfer of the patient to the operating room. Anesthesia shall only be induced once the core temperature is reached around 36 degrees centigrade. One must also ensure warming of the IV fluid as well as the blood products to around 37 degrees centigrade. And use of forced air warming must be used to prevent and treat perioperative hypothermia. Coming to thermoregulation, thermoregulation is a mechanism by which the hypothalamus regulates the body temperature at a stable level in a very narrow interthreshold range. Even infants, they regulate their body temperature remarkably well, but it is less robust in the neonates and elderly, where thermodegradatory system is failing or getting aged. General anesthesia lowers this threshold by 2 to 3 degrees centigrade. This threshold is the temperature, core temperature, at which response is triggered like vasoconstriction and saving, which are beneficial under kind times of hypothermia. This impairment of lower threshold, it causes go to peripheral distribution of the body heat and is the primary cause of hypothermia in most of the patients along with the environmental exposure. Similarly, neurexal anesthesia also impairs both central as well as peripheral chemothermoregulatory uh, control and is associated equally for with the substantial hypothermia. Coming to the physiology of thermoregulation, there are three parts of thermoregulation, afferent input, central control, and effector response. This afferent input is conveyed by the A-delta fibers for the cold signals, by unmyelinated C fibers for the warm signals, and through spinothalamic tracts. Then is the central control and processing, that is mainly uh, processed in hypothalamus and to some extent in the spinal cord and brainstem. The control of autonomic response is around 80% from the core temperature and control of behavioral response is only around 20% from the skin input. The effector response is in, uh, in the form of visodilatation or sweating and either vasoconstriction or and severity. This is again the same afferent input then central regulation followed by the effector response. Effector response is initially cutaneous visoconstriction, then is the non-severing thermogenesis followed by severing. And in cases of the uh, increased threshold, it can be vasodilatation and sweating. This is again the same. The various inputs from the skin deep to the spinal cord and brain reaching the anterior hypothalamus and thereby affecting the interthreshold range. In case the threshold is elevated beyond 0.2 degrees centigrade, the process of vasodilatation and sweating they starts. And if the threshold is decreased by 0.2 degrees centigrade of normal, initially vasoconstriction followed by non severing thermogenesis, and lately severing comes into play. This is again the same thermoregulation under general anesthesia. We can see the interthreshold range is tightly regulated around 0.2 degrees centigrade, near 37 degrees centigrade under normal conditions. The same interthreshold range is widened under anesthesia. We can see almost 2 to 4 degrees centigrade change in the interthreshold range under anesthesia. Under general anesthesia, the behavioral regulations, they play no role as the patients are generally anesthetized, unconscious and mainly paralyzed. Hence, the thermoregulation relies on the autonomic defenses and external temperature management. The interthreshold range, which is normally 0.2 to 0.3 degrees centigrade, has in, is increases up to 10 to 20 folds from 0.3 to around 2 to 4 degrees centigrade. Temperatures within this range do not trigger the thermoregulatory defenses. 
and hence patient becomes poikilothermic. Mirazolam is slightly impairs thermoregulatory control. The painful stimulation can slightly increase vasoconstriction threshold. Therefore, regional or local anesthesia decreases vasoconstriction threshold. Isoflurane and halothane, they impair thermoregulatory vasoconstriction, especially in infants and children. Propohol and volatile anesthetics, they inhibit non-sibling thermogenesis. Infants are at higher risk of hypothermia because of their large surface area to body mass ratio. Overall, sweating is the best preserved thermoregulated defense during general anesthesia. Its threshold is only slightly increased while the gain and maximum intensity remains normal. In contrast, vasoconstriction and sieving thresholds are markedly reduced and efficacy of these response is diminished even after they are being activated. Coming to the temperature measure, a combination of core and mean skin temperature gives accurate estimate of the body heat content. There are various methods like mercury in glass, thermometer. Those are very slow and cumbersome and not recommended nowadays. Electronic thermometers use thermistors or thermocouples. They are suitably accurate, inexpensive and most dependable modality and majorly used in our anesthesia practice. There are infrared monitors that detect the heat given off by radiation and can measure temperature from tympanic membrane and forehead skin. Very commonly, we have seen these during the corona times. They are slightly less reliable, but handy to use. There are various techniques for temperature monitoring. The technique that are based on the expansion of a material as its temperature increases, then techniques which are based on the change in electrical properties with temperature, then techniques which are based on the optical properties of a material. As I already said, mercury and glass is no more in use and they are cumbersome also. Electronic thermometers are quite, quite commonly used in our anesthesia practice. Infrared monitors are handy, though they are not that much reliable. Then there are thermotropic liquid crystals, which are incorporated, incorporated in disposable sheets, are also available, but are less accurate. Coming to the electrical techniques, electrical techniques are based on thermometers and are subdivided into resistance thermometer, thermistor and thermocouples. Resistance thermometers that operate on the principle that the electrical resistance of metals increases with temperature. These devices use a platinum wire as a temperature sensitive register. The platinum wire is incorporated in a Wheatstone bit circuit which accurately measures very small changes in resistance. Then the thermistors, these are the semiconductors and display opposite behavior with regards to electrical resistance. In thermistor, when they are heated, the electrical resistance in decreases. Thermistors are being in solid state device, display fast response to changes in temperature. That is, a very little heat is needed to increase their temperature. Most of the temperature probe we are using in anesthesia are thermistor based. For example, pulmonary artery catheter or the esophageal probes. The poor probe, probe placement is the most common cause for the inaccurate reading or physical damage that results into high resistance can also result in inaccurate results, uh, readings. Thermocouples are the conductors that generate a voltage in response to a temperature gradient. These are various thermometers based on the mercury, infrared and electrical modes of technique. Then coming to various monitoring sites, none of the guidelines specify which technique is best or which site is best to monitor temperature. Hence, the site and device is mainly decided by clinician, the type of surgery or the accessibility of monitoring sites. The various sites which are used for temperature monitoring are the core sites, that is pulmonary artery, distal esophagus probes or tympanic membrane nasopharynx. They are reliable. Even during extreme thermal changes, they are less affected by visometer or th thermoregulatory mechanisms. The various intermediate sites are oral, rectal or bladder temperature probes. They are not too, uh, that much reliable during the rapid thermal perturbations. Then most common one is the skin surface where we can monitor the temperature though its reliability is lower than the core one, but it gives a reasonable reflection of the core temperature provided adequate adjustment for the core to skin gradient are made.
This is a tympanic membrane temperature probe. Nasopharyngeal temperature probes are commonly used during general anesthesia, and this tympanic membrane temperature monitoring is commonly seen in under regional anesthesia. Coming to various heat loss mechanisms under anesthesia when the patient is lying on the operating table, heat loss can be through convection, radiation, evaporation, and conduction. Most common method for heat loss is convection along with radiation. Conduction and evaporation, they contribute very less. Coming to intraoperative hypothermia, the risk of intraoperative hypothermia increases with prolonged surgery, extremes of age, extensive burns, lower preoperative temperature under severe trauma, and major intraoperative fluid shift. The hypothermia under general anesthesia occurs from a combination of anesthetic-induced impaired thermoregulation, vasodilatation, inhibition of vasoconstriction, reduced metabolic rate by 20 to 30 percent, exposure to cold environment, one of the important factors, the OT temperature remaining cold, use of cleaning and irrigating fluids, cold intravenous fluids, and then heat transfer or loss from the body. As I already said, radiation and convection, they contribute most to the perioperative heat loss and hence hypothermia. There are high risk group which are prone for the hypothermia, especially hypothyroid patients, patients of myothenia gravis, neonates, preterm kids, and elderly who are undergoing major surgeries where the thermoregulatory responses failed. Hypothermia under general anesthesia has three phases. First is initial rapid decrease, second is slow linear reduction, and third one is the plateau phase. Coming to the three phases of hypothermia, the initial first hour is the phase one, whereby temperature, core temperature decreases from 0.5 to 1.5 degrees centigrade, and mainly because of the redistribution of heat from the core to the periphery. Phase two that starts after one hour and lasts for two to four hours is the linear phase of fall in the core temperature. And this is because the heat loss, it exceeds the metabolic heat production. Then after three to four hours occurs the phase three, that is the plateau phase, when heat loss is equal to the metabolic heat production, though it is not a thermal steady state. Hypothermia under neuraxial anesthesia is like general anesthesia. It is equally common and equally severe. It is because of the impaired behavior as well as autonomic thermoregulation. Here the core temperature initially decreases to point from 0 0.5 to 1. 0 degree centigrade. Under neuraxial blocks, the thermal inputs are blocked from the anesthetized regions, and this reduces vasoconstriction and severing threshold by 0 0.6 degree centigrade above the level of the block. Reduction in these threshold is proportional to the number of spinal segments blocked. Means the more the number of segments blocked, there is more reduction in the uh, compensatory threshold of vasoconstriction and severing. Hypothermia during neuroxial block may be as severe as general anesthesia. And it is augmented by use of analgesics and sedative supplements that also impair the thermoregulation. Decrease may not plate you since now block inhibits the peripheral vasoconstriction. Hence, under regional anesthesia, patients often do not recognize being hypothermic. They may sever, sever without feeling cold. Now, coming to prevention of redistribution hypothermia, for this, we can initially start with preoperative warming. As per the NICE guidelines, that recommends preoperative warming of the patients to a temperature around 36 degrees centigrade in a comfortably warm environment. For this, a skin surface warming for up to 30 minutes must be started before induction of anesthesia to prevent the redistribution of hypothermia. To warm the patients at least for an hour before induction of anesthesia, one can use forced air warming that will help in less fall in the core temperature and decrease intraoperative hypothermia. The efficacy of pre-warming in children by increasing the ambient temperature in the OT room by up to 26 degrees centigrade for around 30 to 40 minutes has been found very effective and safe. Coming to the intraoperative management, 
We can use airway heating and humidification by use of HME and other methods, but it is not that reliable and that effective because heat loss is around only 10% from the respiratory tract. Warming in warming intravenous fluids is important, especially in conditions where large quantity of cold fluids can result into the significant heat loss and hypothermia. The guidelines say even one unit of refrigerated blood or one liter of crystalloid at room temperature can reduce the mean body temperature by 0.25 degrees centigrade. Though low flow rates for IV infusion up to less than 35 ml per minute, the warming may not be required, especially in adults. Fluid warming is the only method that produces direct core warming and is recommended for all interoperative infusions exceeding 500 ml in adults. As per the WHO guidelines, Keeping patient warm is more important than warming blood. Warming of blood is recommended when we are using large volume of transfusion, say in adults more than 50 ml per kg per hour or in children 15 ml per kg per hour. Also especially it is important during exchange transfusion in infants and patients with clinically significant cold agglutinins. Then there are various few warming devices most commonly used one is the warming cabinets, which are cheap, simple, convenient and safe. They can even store large volumes, especially in conditions where massive transfusion is required like burns and trauma. Then there are dry warming system, counter current heat exchangers, water baths, convective air systems and insulators. These are two sizes of fluid warming cabinets, which are commonly used in our anesthesia practice. Coming to the operating room temperature. Operating room temperature is the most critical factor that determines cutaneous losses through radiation, convection and even evaporation. Room temperature shall be maintained at around 23 degrees centigrade for adults and 26 degrees centigrade for infants respectively to maintain normal thermia. As per the revised NABS guidelines for air conditioning operation theater, temperature must be maintained around 21 plus minus 3 degrees centigrade with relative humidity of 40% to 60% respectively and overall relative humidity of 55%. And for these, appropriate display of these factors must be used. A minimum of 25 air exchanges per hour with minimum of four changes having fresh air component is required and airflow must be unidirectional and downwards onto the OT table. Coming to the cutaneous warming. Cutaneous warming in operation theater can be achieved by passive insulation and or active warming. For passive insulation, there are cotton blankets, surgical tapes, plastic sheets, reflective composites, space blankets, and sleeping bags that can be used. This insulation is provided by the layer of steel air, which is trapped beneath the device. A single layer of this insulation reduces heat loss by approximately 30%, and any additional extra layer doesn't further reduce heat loss and is not that effective. Coming to active warming. For active warming, there are various devices that include circulating water mattress or garments, forced air warmers, resistive heating devices, negative pressure water warming system, and gradient heaters. Beside these technologies, interoperative warming also depends on the patient age, the type of surgery, duration of surgery, disease state of the patient, and use of anesthetics. Forced air warmers are the most commonly tested, recommended, and used devices for intraoperative warming. This is a type of forced air warming from the bear hugger, and these are the water blankets we use in our operation theaters. Coming to postoperative warming therapy, again, the forced air blankets and radiant heaters are most commonly used warming devices in post anesthesia care unit. Coming to some of the entities which are deleterious, one is the post anesthesia severing. It is seen in up to 40% of the patients receiving anesthesia for surgery. The incidence is higher in young patients, with patients with low core temperature preoperatively, and it results into, results into increased oxygen consumption, raised intraocular pressure and intracranial pressure, and cardiac dysfunction. It shall be managed with increasing the normal ambient temperature and use of skin surface warming from the uh, forced air warmers or radiant heaters must be used. Various drugs are used also for control of shivering. Most commonly used are pethidine, clonidine, 
dexmethotomidine and tramadol. Pethidine and dexmethotomidine are quite effective. Pethidine reduces sieving through salt twice as much as vasoconstriction threshold. Now, hyperthermia and fever. Hyperthermia is more dangerous and serious as compared to similar degree of hypothermia. It indicates poor temperature exceeded the normal values. It causes discomfort in an increase in metabolic demand and cardiovascular stress. Passive hyperthermia results from excessive patient heating without adequate monitoring of core temperature. It is commonly seen in infants and children as sweating and anesthesia is less effective in these. It shall be treated by discontinuing the active warming and removing excessive insulation. Fever indicates regulated increase in core temperature targeted by the thermoregulatory system and it develops when the endogenous pyrogens, they elevate the set point of the thermoregulatory system. Fever is relatively rare under general anesthesia since volatile and static opioids, they inhibit expression of fever. Perioperative fever can be due to infection, mismatched blood transfusions, blood in fourth ventricle and allergic reactions. Some, of the, some degree of fever can be seen after surgery because of tissue trauma. Fever is treated by removing underlying cause, use of antibiotics, antipyretics, and finally by cautious active cooling if it is severe. Coming to some special scenarios, hypothermia is deleterious, but it has potential benefits also during for example, in myocardial infarction, organ transplant, cardiopulmonary bypass, spinal injuries, intestinal ischemia, and neonatal hypoxic ischemia. Coming to cardiopulmonary bypass, during bypass, it needs a systematic approach for hypothermia as well as rewarming. Generally, multiple sites of temperature monitoring are used, including myocardial temperature monitoring. Cardiopulmonary bypass initiates with mild hypothermia initially, going into moderate that is 26 to 32 degrees and up to deep hypothermia that is 20 to 25 degrees centigrade. The lower the temperature, the longer the time for cooling as well as rewarming. Rewarming shall begin 10 to 15 minutes before release of the aortic cross clamp. The gradient between heat exchanger and nasopharynx during rewarming is maintained at 2 to 3 degrees centigrade. Coming to deep hypothermic circulatory arrest. Deep hypothermic circulatory arrest facilitates meticulous and complex cerebral and cardiac procedures under cardiopulmonary bypass, including aortic arch surgeries and aneurysm surgeries. These surgeries are generally performed at deep hypothermia of 20 to 25 degrees centigrade while stopping blood circulation and brain function up to an hour. Despite such low temperatures, there are chances of neurological ischemia. Therefore, adjuvants for neuroprotection must always be used in the form of pharmacotherapy as well as high schooling of the head. Dewarming should precisely be controlled because basically we are trying to protect the brain. The rest of the body can idly can deal fairly well with these heat and cold periods, but the brain is most adversely affected by temperature, especially overheating. Thank you. Now we can have Thank you, Dr. Ashok, for a detailed discussion on uh, temperature thermoregulation and temperature monitoring. I think uh, he has dis uh, discussed everything in detail. Any questions from the audience? No, ma'am. I think we can proceed with another next. Dr. Sanjeev Sharma, Professor in the Department of Anesthesia, 